Hello, and welcome to the 2018 Summer Webcast Series offered to you by the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Master Gardener Program. My name is Susan DeBleek, and I wanted to give you a quick introduction to our presentation today. The Growing Season Webcast Series is offered to Master Gardeners and community members each summer to expand your gardening knowledge and take your Master Gardener volunteer projects to the next level. We're excited about all of the presenters that we have this year. Today you're going to be listening to the presentation called Compost 101 and Growing Roses. You're going to learn about the basics of composting, plus what research is showing about what compost does. And then you're going to learn about roses, their history in Iowa, and how to grow the best roses to make your garden shine. A couple materials we have for you today. You've got a worksheet so you can take notes and reference some of the resources listed here in the presentation today. And that's also where you'll see the link to the online evaluation so that you can give us feedback on this presentation. If you are a Master Gardener, please make sure to log your continuing education hours. Ten hours of continuing education are required each year to be logged to be an active Master Gardener. Our first presenter is Ajay Nair, and he's going to be speaking to you about compost. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Ajay Nair, and I'm an associate professor and a vegetable extension specialist in the Department of Horticulture at uh, Iowa State University. I'm uh, really happy that uh, you all are interested to learn more about uh, composting and understanding how compost is made and how can uh, it be very efficiently uh, used in our gardens to grow vegetables, ornamental plants. Uh, to begin with, I let you know that compost is an excellent amendment that can be added to improve soil and make your production system more healthy and mo make your soil uh, more vibrant. Uh, so let's delve into the topic of composting to enhance soil fertility. So the first question we should ask is why are we composting? So as you can see on this slide, there are a number of benefits of composting. Number one is composting diverts waste, uh, which would have otherwise ended in our landfills. You know, so you are saving valuable space, and in general, you are helping the environment. So definitely that's, that's the plus. Uh, if you add uh, compost, which is the end process of composting uh, into your soil, in your uh, flower beds, you are improving the quality of the soil. You are improving soil structure and tilt. And I will show you some examples later on on how that reflects on the growth of your plant. Uh, when you add compost to the soil, uh, you improve the inherent capacity of the uh, soil uh, to hold more moisture. So think of about years when uh, there is a drought or think about months in a specific year for example here in Iowa in July August you know you are raising your pumpkins or you're raising your tomatoes or peppers and there's a long stretch of time or period when there are no rains so that produces stress for the plant so it has been shown through research that soils that are amended with compost have inherent ability to hold on to that moisture for a longer period of time so that's a big plus again building soil so that it can be uh, a reserve for excess moisture uh, allows for water drainage so a compost also helps uh, the ability of the soil to absorb more moisture, uh, more water, so it increases the drainage and the water holding capacity. It slowly releases nutrients. So think of compost as a source for the uh, macronutrients, for example, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, micronutrients such as boron, manganese, uh, iron. So all those elements are essential elements and they are needed by your plants to grow. So when you add compost to the soil, uh, compost slowly releases those nutrients which can be taken up by the plant for their growth. Uh, compost also encourages beneficial microorganisms in the soil and suppresses some of the bad pathogens or the bad soil borne diseases. So think of it as a, uh, a product uh, which has beneficial microorganisms which fight uh, with the bad ones and because of which you don't have uh, much of the soil borne diseases and pathogens. 
uh, and uh, it certainly replaces the need for commercial soil amendments and fertilizers so you can be more sustainable uh, you can uh, create more of a closed loop system where you are bringing less of the synthetic materials from outside although i'm not against them you know it's uh, fair to be more sustainable so use uh, the synthetic inputs inputs more judiciously that's what i would say so in short uh, adding compost to your soil will improve the quality of your soil and, and enhance plant growth so that's why we need to add compost quite a lot of list there right um, so uh, let's talk about uh, where to compost because if you have decided yes I'm going to compost most of the waste uh, products that I generate in my house where would I compost uh, what are some of the places where commonly composting takes place home gardens a natural fit uh, uh, for, for any home gardener uh, they can uh, they have waste that comes out of the yard there is waste that comes out of your kitchen and I'll go through some of the do's and don'ts of some things that can be added and some should not be added but certainly home garden a great uh, location uh, for composting community garden plot so let's say if you are involved in your uh, district or in your community um, uh, with, with, with some of the school programs where kids get a handle on how to grow plants and how to maintain garden how to grow produce maybe that's a good place to have a compost pile because that will not only help uh, the, the benefits I mentioned earlier but it also serves as an educational platform where you are making others see what composting is and and try to learn from them and make it better uh, school gardens again part of the community garden plot uh, and then the question would be when to when to compost are there any specific time periods during a year where composting works better well at home you could compost year-round uh, it does you don't have to wait for any specific month for the summer or the spring to arrive uh, you can compost throughout the year although the the process of composting slows down when the temperatures go down in the fall so uh, starting October November uh, the the microorganisms that help with the with the composting will not be as active as they should be just because of the falling temperatures and think about December January February we are in sub zero or, or close to zero or definitely below 32 degree Fahrenheit uh, so uh, uh, in that case you know obviously the composting won't progress at the speed you want uh, but you can still you know have a pile which will take a longer time uh, to compost uh, at a community garden school plot of course spring summer fall those are the time periods where composting will work uh, quickly and you'll get results uh, faster uh, and then uh, once you have decided you know where to do when to do it uh, this is uh, one of the most important slide I would like to uh, uh, focus on or, or mention is what are some of the ingredients uh, that you need uh, to start the composting process. I'm, I've, I'm not going to go in detail on specific ingredients, but what I have here is a general category. These are the four categories or four things that are absolutely needed for composting so, so that you can get some good quality compost. So number one are the greens. And what are the things that uh, uh, contribute or add towards greens? Uh, any material which is nitrogen rich and <laughs> as the name suggests green in color uh, are the greens so think about your grass clippings think about leaves um, also some of the food waste you generate the peels of fruits and, and vegetables those are all green and the reason they are called green is because they can quickly disintegrate and decompose and provide the energy and the heat for the composting to start so these are products that will quickly disintegrate so those will be categorized under greens the next category are the browns uh, these are the carbon rich material which are dry and, and that's how you can remember brown which is kind of dried material so it could be um, let's say your mulch which you used uh, and you have some extra laying around or some of the old mulch it could be twigs it could be wood chunks and pieces uh, bark uh, anything that takes a longer time to disintegrate uh, think about hay uh, 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 straw those kind of things um, not hay but straw definitely would be counting towards the brown uh, the third one is water oftentimes when we start a compost pile or when we uh, set up a compost pile we forget about water 
uh, we don't add water to that pile when we start and uh, which is absolutely critical it's critical to add water because think about what is in the compost uh, compost pile which is working for you it's the microbes and as all living organisms they need water too to survive and do what they do uh, uh, to to get their metabolism going get the chemical reactions going so water is essential so please don't forget to add water to the compost pile when you start and the fourth uh, important ingredient is again similar to water it's oxygen those microbes need oxygen to grow so if you stack a big lot of stuff in the in the right ratio with the greens and the browns and water but you pack them so much that there is no air space there is no pore space for air to move in uh, then also you are compromising uh, the, the process of composting because there's not enough oxygen for those microbes to grow and breathe so make sure you have enough space and and oxygen can be you know when you stack things up there's in, there is definitely space in there which, where oxygen uh, will be trapped and, and provide uh, uh, for growth of the microorganisms and every time you turn the pile you are adding and infusing more oxygen so so you will be fine later on but don't pack the pile too much so uh, coming back to the fact uh, okay, if we know we need to add those four cat or we need to have those four essential ingredients, uh, uh, what are some of the materials that can be composted? Uh, vegetable and fruit scraps, coffee grounds. Uh, nowadays, there are uh, coffee companies that are uh, manufacturing their, you know, uh, coffee, you know, with, with come in small sachet, and these sachets are biodegradable. So definitely those coffee grounds and the filters of the coffee could be used. Tea bags, again, the same thing. Uh, some companies are manufacturing tea bags that can biodegrade. Eggshells, grass clippings, usually in the summer when you are mowing your lawn, uh, you can, if you are collecting the grass clippings, that can go into the compost pile. Leaves, young weeds, again, young weeds. Uh, you don't want any uh, weed plant that has matured, has an inflorescence, or has a seed head uh, on it. Because if you're adding that, then you are probably adding more weed seeds into the pile. So only young weeds. Pine needles, they can be uh, used. So uh, a myriad of uh, 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 ingredients that can go, materials that can go into a compost pile. Now, uh, th those would be, I'll go back here, those would be more of the greens. This is the greens category. You can see most of them will disintegrate or decompose fairly quickly. So they are in the greens. And the next category would be browns. Uh, and these are, again, carbon-rich products. So these are leaves uh, in the fall. So think about, you know, your ashes, your maples. Uh, when they have, you know, uh, shed their leaves, those the leaves are pretty dry. They are crinkly. They are, they have, they are more uh, carbon. There's more carbon in them. So those can be added. So if you are scraping your lawn, uh, don't, don't just throw away that leaf. Uh, you can use that for your composting, compost pile, and, and call it to be the, in the brown category. Dry grass clippings. Paper, cardboard, and newspapers. Uh, although I would say, you know, newspapers nowadays, uh, the ink which they use is again uh, biodegradable. It's not synthetic, so that's fine. Cardboard, I would not suggest putting like a whole big piece of cardboard in there. If you can cut it into small pieces, that will help uh, for it to disintegrate faster. Otherwise, it will just stay there as a big chunk. Pine needles, old potting soil. So you know, in the fall when you are cleaning up, some of those annuals, hanging baskets. Uh, those media, the, the peat-based media which is in there, that can be very well added to the compost pile. Uh, food, soiled paper, napkins and towels. And I'll show you uh, an example where here at Iowa State University I have used the dining waste uh, from different dormitories and dining places. And this will that usually has the soiled papers and napkins which can go very well in the compost pile. Stale flour, cereals, spices. Um, <laughs> when it comes to spices, you know, don't, you don't want to add spice and make the compost pile spicy unless you really want to do it. But uh, try to avoid spices which have high capsaicin. Uh, again, that will hurt the microorganisms. But if it's a big pile, not a problem, you know. Why not have a spicy compost, right? <laughs> uh, Paper-based egg cartons, that can go. So those will contribute or add towards the uh, browns part of the uh, compost. Now, some of the things which we absolutely want you to avoid, uh, meat products, dairy products, 
pet waste, uh, and meat and dairy products primarily because of the odor they generate. So uh, it could be very stinky. And in the fall, later in the fall, if you have a compost pile or a compost bin, which ha which let's say you added meat and dairy, which is very stinky, you would attract many critters. You know, you don't want uh, uh, small animals in your backyard and going through your compost a pile or your bin, you you uh, raccoons and all, they would love to go to that pile if there is smell and odor coming. So you don't want to do that. Even you know rats uh, and mice. Uh, pet waste. The reason we uh, recommend not to add the pet pet waste and clay kitty litter because there are a lot of pathogens which humans share with the animals. So we don't want any kind of pathogen that could be transferred. Let's say you added pet waste. It, it stays in the compost. You add that compost in your in your garden, in your vegetable uh, raised bed, and then you know some way the contamination happens, and you know somebody might consume that, or the pathogen might move into the person. So we don't want that to happen. A lot of garden soil. Uh, you can use garden soil now. When I say garden soil, this is a regular soil, not the soilless mix. If you use a lot of garden soil, you might uh, compact the pile or compact, make, make, make less airflow, uh, can create less airflow. So that's why not a lot of garden soil. And uh, of course, weeds with seed heads uh, absolutely uh, do not add the weeds with seed head because you don't want your compost to be all containing all those weed seeds. And you, when you add this compost to your vegetable uh, beds or, or flower beds, you are adding weeds and you don't want that. So please avoid that. So that being said, what would be a good recipe uh, to, to make a good quality compost? Because not all composts are made equal. Uh, keep, keep this in mind. I'll come to this again. Not all composts are made equal. You can make some pretty nasty compost too if you did not follow the right process. And actually, uh, instead of benefiting the soil, you might hurt the soil. So it's important you follow the, the right recipe or kind of be in that ballpark. So we need an adequate mix of high nitrogen, which are leaves, grass clippings, fruit, grain residues, and high carbon residues. And those are like branches, old grass, sawdust, those high carbon products. So we need a right balance uh, of those. Uh, roughly half of the carbon is lost as carbon dioxide in, during the composting process as the volume reduces. So, <clears throat> And same is true is with nitrogen. We start with the higher nitrogen, but then the nitrogen falls down, it goes down. Uh, and again, adequate oxygen is the key for the pile to heat up because if you, let's say, created a pile of compost and if it's not heating up, it, it means that the, the proportion of the greens and the browns were not correct or maybe the water is not there. So a lot could be going on. So you need to have the right proportion to have adequate oxygen for the pile to heat up. So uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, the way we measure the quality of the compost is uh, primarily using this indicator called the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So this is the amount of carbon and nitrogen in your pile. So when you start your pile, if you are making a pile of compost, the carbon to nitrogen ratio should be in the range of 30 is to 1, which means 30 parts of carbon to one part of nitrogen. So that is what we are aiming for. Now, let me tell you, this is not easy to add the bunch of stuff which we just went through and, and uh, exactly figure out, oh, this ratio, this material is the one which I, th this, this amount of the green and, and, black and browns to add to get to this ratio. But what we are doing here is we are trying to be close to that ratio. And I'll, I'll show you an example how you can go to that ratio. So the start should be at 30s to 1. And at the end of the composting process, that carbon to nitrogen ratio should have fallen to about 15 to 20 is to 1. So 15 is to 1 or 20 is to 1. This is a good quality compost uh, because if the carbon to nitrogen ratio stays pretty high, let's say you started with 50 is to 1, which is not what we're looking for, but let's say it ended up being 50 is to 1, and at the end you are at 30 is to 1. So in this case, uh, the nitrogen in the compost is not available for the microbes. So there could be nitrogen immobilization so what will happen is that the microbes in the when you add the compost to your plants, the microbes in the compost, since th there's not enough nitrogen in the compost, they will start mining the nitrogen from the soil, and the plants will suffer, will show nutrient deficiency, especially for nitrogen. So you do not want nitrogen immobilization to happen, which happens when you add products which have high carbon to nitrogen ratio. That's why we are targeting 
the carbon to nitrogen ratio to be between 15 is 15 to 1 to 20 is to 1. So what is the what is the thumb of, you know uh, uh, rule of thumb uh, to kind of get to that ratio at the start of 30 is to 1 and so this is what I would suggest uh, 1 is to 2 green to brown so if you are adding one part of green add two parts of brown so if you follow that ratio you would end up in that 30s to 1 range so again one unit of green material to two units of brown material so again some of the materials for green grass clippings vegetable residues of all kinds plant parts fresh leaves and for brown wood pieces sawdust old leaves a ground tree branches of all sizes so all that can be added to, uh, to be part of the brown so again one part of green to two parts of brown let's look at some of the structures you know we have an idea of what to add what ratio we should use and what carbon to nitrogen ratio we are shooting for what are some of the structures that can be used for composting so a successful compost container can take many forms so there is no uh, uh, set fast rule that this is the container to compost this is the magical proportion or this is the magic material which uh, uh, not material but this is the structure that will provide the high quality compost it can be either homemade it could be store purchased so there is no again set container that you can use I'll show you some examples this here is simply a loose pile an open pile with no barriers uh, this is a compost pile. If you if you ask me technically, yes, this is a compost pile. There's a lot of a brown material I see there. There's some green materials that would have been mixed in there. This is a compost pile. There is no structure here at all. This is just out in the open. Well, can you do that? Yes, you can. But is it recommended? I would say no. Uh, just because, you know, uh, uh, it, this again attracts uh, animals which can come uh, and again, if the animals are there, they will, if they lay uh, feces, their feces and all can contaminate the, uh, the compost pile. Again, you don't want an open lot sitting like that. That being said, if you are living in an acreage, let's say behind, uh, back in the wood, there is an area where you're not doing anything, you can start a compost pile like that. Uh, and this would be called uh, like a passive composting because if you are not turning your compost on a regular basis, you are simply just letting it sit there and in that case, probably for one to two years, this process is also composting, but it's called passive composting because you did not actively manage that pile. You did not mix it to add oxygen. Again, if you do not mix it, not much oxygen is going in. Again, it slows down the process of composting, not much air, and again, water. This is an open condition. Sometime it would rain a lot. It would get too wet. Sometime it would get too dry. So that's why the composting takes a longer period of time. So I have commercial growers I work with. Uh, I have seen them using like a passive composting process where the pile will sit for about two years. And then third or fourth year, they would just spread it in their field. That, that's okay, but again, it takes a longer amount of time. This is something uh, on a smaller scale for homeowners. This is a, like a one bin system where you add things from the top and at the bottom the drawer opens. You will notice there are those uh, pocket, those side vents, many of those side holes that allow oxygen to get in. That's why it's important that we have air. And you know, in this case, if you're actively uh, mixing things, you can make compost in about six to eight weeks. But if you're not actively mixing, it will take a little bit longer time. Tumbling composter, many of you would have used it already or would have seen it. Again, you just add stuff, fill it up, and with, definitely don't forget to add water and keep it turning. So every three days you will just tumble and that way it mixes things together, adds oxygen, uh, 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 uniformly distributes the heat which builds up when you start composting. So this is, this is what I have in my house and it's working great. In the summer I can generate compost mm, typically in, once I fill one side of it in about two to three months. In the winter, it takes a long time, maybe sometimes six months for me to make compost. But since there are two uh, pockets or two con uh, containers in there, two sides, I can fill one and start working on my tumbling and while, at the sec while I fill the second one. And while I get done with the second one, the first is done. So I can, I can make it work that way. So this is a great uh, resource to have for homeowners. This is a wood pallet system. In this case, uh, uh, it's just... Uh, wood pallets created uh, to maybe a four four by four 
uh, four feet, four four by four. So it seems like four feet high, four feet wide, and four feet deep. You can you can use it and again pile things up in the right ratio to make make the make your compost. Now this is a wire bin system where simply using wire uh, and cage system. Uh, again, this uh, this might attract. Uh, animals in your neighborhood, and especially raccoons and all, uh, and, and mice and rat. So definitely put a cage or some kind of wiring so that animals cannot get into it. Uh, but this is, again, good. There's a lot of air movement that happens. The challenge here is how will you mix it? So you, turning is a problem here. You can't do that. So this system has to sit for an extended period of time for the compost to be good quality. So if you are planning to make a, a, a like a pallet system, uh, I would recommend go, making it at least three feet high, uh, three feet by three feet. Uh, that's because otherwise we have noticed that there is not, uh, not much heat buildup. And heat is necessary. When you mix the pile with the right ratio, you will see, you should see the temperature of the pile go up uh, to, in some cases, 150, 160 degree Fahrenheit. It is really hot in there. And that is needed because at that temperature, all the weed seeds would be killed. Some of the bad pathogens will be killed. So it's and some of the chemicals will break down. So you need that r increase of temperature. Typically, it happens second and the third day after you mix it. Um, and then uh, once it's at 160, 150, you mix it. It goes down to about maybe 65, 70. Three or four days again, it goes up. You again mix it. So you mix it multiple times during this period of two months or three months, and that's called active composting, where you are mixing it every three or four days and letting air in and, and uh, uh, create uh, the compost. So this is what the uh, uh, log would look like. So on x-axis, I have time, and on uh, uh, y-axis, I have temperature. In this case, the pile was mixed. It was at about 80 degree Fahrenheit. You can see as the time progresses, the temperature uh, goes up, in this case, up here. This would take about three to four days, around 140, 150. Uh, and then you turn it. Uh, you turn it actually here. When you turn it, it goes down. Again, after some time, it goes up. You again turn it. It goes down. And so eventually, it will not be reaching very high temperatures, but you can see these peaks where whenever you turn, the temperature goes up. And at the end, when you turn, it won't go up that much because a lot of those nitrogen nitrogenous material, the, the quick de the decomposing material has already degraded, so there's not much heat that could be produced. But at this point here, you could say, okay, the composting is coming to an end. And this is active, process, active composting and might take about two months, two to three months. Um, uh, this, uh, this shows you how the turning frequency and pile uh, temperature uh, are correlated. In this case, when you can see, uh, let's talk, start with the, the, the bottom line here. This is a pile which uh, was turned every 30 days, so every month. You can say it started with 80, it builds up, and every 30 days it's turned, it kind of stays at that 120 uh, degree Fahrenheit range. If the pile was turned every 10 days, you can see the temperatures are higher, 130, 140, which is good. We want the temperatures to be high so that they can kill the pathogens and the microbes, and the bad, bad microbes, bad pathogens, and the weed seeds. And if you're turning every three days, the, the temperature goes really up. It goes to about 160. So after three or four days, again, you mix it. It will go up somewhere in this range. So that's a more faster way of creating compost. So there is a direct correlation of how quickly you turn your pile uh, and how high the temperature could get. So in a nutshell, this is what's happening in a compost pile. You're adding organic matter, you're adding water, oxygen. There's a lot of microbes that act, and they release water, which is in, in form of water vapor. Carbon dioxide is released, heat is released, ammonia is released, and that's why sometimes you get the smell of the ammonia. If you have been to a commercial compost making facility, you'll smell ammonia in the air. And the, and the end process of all the processes here is the compost. So here I would like to highlight a class exercise which I have done uh, in my class here uh, uh, where students are learning about vegetable production. They take one lab exercise and they create, start a compost pile. And by the end of the semester, the compost pile is ready. And they can see how they have transformed some of the waste materials into the useful compost. So it's all, it's always an eye opener for these students because when they add things they are not that happy because I'm making them handle 
horse manure and dining waste and you know it, it's very soupy I should say not not that great and the, by the end of the semester they see that oh this has changed into a nice soil like black product which doesn't smell at all so it's I, I feel like making compost is like a transformative process you know you transform and your ideas change you know you you feel very good when you see the transformation happening and when you know that you have done it so quickly going on to the exercise uh, so what I have used again to come close to that 30 is to 1 ratio of the carbon to nitrogen this is what I have done uh, two bales of straw two bales of hay uh, finished compost I also add finished compost about one five gallon bucket and that's because to uh, uh, add some of those beneficial microorganisms which are already there in this finished compost and try to spread them across this pile so if you have a finished compost great uh, go ahead and use it so just kind of inoculating good microorganisms into the pile horse manure I would I have used a wheelbarrow sawdust again that's to add that brown material to get that uh, brown material uh, in there food waste from student cafeteria uh, three to four five gallon buckets and again as I said this is pretty soupy and pretty <laughs> you don't want to handle this let me put it this way it's all gooey stuff and all the waste that comes out of the dining uh, what students waste and of course we don't want the students to waste food but there is some waste generated and how can we put it back and, and not put it in the in the uh, uh, landfill so food waste and also peat moss again peat moss I feel like when I add moss it helps to add and soak in that moisture and hold it in there and so this is uh, this is the recipe which I have used uh, which I learned from uh, uh, my mentor uh, when I was uh, at Michigan State Dr. John Bienbaum he used to teach uh, compost making course and I had I was in the class and, and I kind of learned from him so uh, you know I, he was a great mentor in terms of figuring out he ha he helped me understand the process and also he would mix different ratios of materials to figure out which is the best one and I feel like this was the one he he also recommends so here we are uh, you can see making compost all those stuff uh, in here this is compost this is peat we have uh, straw and hay uh, we have and uh, students are here busy uh, mixing everything and you have the four in this case we have a four by four uh, pallet system we have built four by four four by four so four by four by four and we are adding things in layers so a little bit of hay then straw then food waste then uh, manure which are which is already mixed with sawdust and so we are kind of just making a lasagna I should say <laughs> maybe not the right term to <laughs> to explain this but uh, similar to lasagna th that's what is happening and at the end our pile would look like this and so you can see uh, it's a huge pile uh, with all those things which I just mentioned in, in the in the slide uh, listed listed the things and I have also stuck a, a temperature here so we, can, we have stuck a temperature to know what the pile temperature is so this is what the pile temperature was when we made the compost this was in February it's about 62 64 degree Fahrenheit and three days later the temperature as you can see here is about 143 degree Fahrenheit so a big jump from 63 to about 143 um, so you can see about 80 degree Fahrenheit temperature 80 degree difference in there in three days so 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 this was the right mix we think because it helps to increase the temperature so quickly in, in, in three days and this is the log which the students maintained and you can see this was mixed on a Monday 2 7 so second 7th of February it, uh, it was at 65 70 90 going up on next day 160 or 9 so in, in two days 160 and you can see 100, 160 159 it was kind of mixed here 159 45 46 it's slowly going down as we are turning every three or four days it's going down it's not going to go up that high once it has reached there but still it stays pretty high 145 140 138 and these are the dates 27 all the way to 32 so about I would say a month and in one month we are still able to create temperatures up to 121 uh, degree uh, so this pile was done in about two and a half months again we are every week we are taking it out we are mixing and putting it back in every week so that's why you see these temperatures staying so high uh, and that's the key so once the compost is made in that in, in our case you definitely have to screen it because there might be some uh, bigger pieces and chunks which have not gone through uh, 
uh, or which are you know still not you know uh, pretty uh, which are still pretty big and when you, when you add that to your uh, uh, flower beds or vegetable beds you know those might not be that good looking or it might aesthetically not be that good so in that case you can use a screen and that helps to screen things and you get this get that nice black material called compost that can be added so you can see here at the bottom this pile here nice fine material uh, dry no smell at all that, that can be used uniform compost so let's quickly go through some of the troubleshooting like some of the things that can happen while you're making compost uh, symptom the compost pile has a bad odor. So the problem, pile is too wet and there is not enough oxygen. That is why you have bad odor. What is the solution? Turn the compost and add dry brown material. So if you face this situation, uh, probably it's because of a lack of oxygen and too wet. So that's why you need to add more dry matter, more dry material, brown material, and definitely mixing things up. Another problem. The pile fails to heat up. So you make a pile, but it doesn't heat up. And the problem, compost pile is too small. So that's why I indicated having a 3x3x3. Three by three by three. Uh, so a, a small pile won't heat up. So collect more materials and mix the mix into piles. Now when you're using a tumbling composter, you're not expecting it to heat up a lot. But you'll see it heats up uh, to, to a certain extent. So in that case, it should be okay. But if you're making a pile, make sure the pile is big enough so that it heats up. Symptom, the center of the pile is dry. So when you're mixing every seven days or five days, you're reconstituting and pulling it out and putting it back, you see that the center is dry. The problem is not enough water. And the solution is chop any coarse material remaining in the pile and add green material and moisten the pile. That will address that problem. So uh, I showed you some of three key issues which we see uh, when someone is making compost and that can be easily rectified. So no problem at all. So uh, going back to some of the characteristics of compost, uh, uh, to sum things up about compost, it's an excellent soil amendment. It improves soil structure. It helps uh, to f soil to hold more water, so improves the water holding capacity. And definitely it revives the soil. The microbes would love you to death <laughs> that you have added compost because they will feel really good. Uh, because they have some nutrients and, 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 and again, the soil is, becomes more habitable uh, for them. Uh, compost also helps to reduce compaction and the bulk density. Uh, so if you have uh, a, a, a site which is you think it's very much com compacted, you can use compost and, and try it. And compost will help to make that compaction slowly go away. It builds organic matter and it definitely helps with disease suppression. So in your garden, in your yard, if you know there are certain spots where you are seeing repeated diseases or the plants don't grow that well, they are stunted, add compost. You should see some benefits. They will definitely come back. Uh, they will definitely reduce the amount of bad pathogens. And as the good ones increase, the bad ones go away. Uh, uh, and one thing which I would like to mention is do not view compost as simply N, P, and K, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Compost does provide those, but they solely are not used as a fertilizer. You know, there are many other benefits like what is listed here, which compost provides. So uh, don't look at comparing synthetic fertilizer and compost, and synthetic will always do better because, you know, it's the synthetic form right nitrogen is right available when you add uh, then and there as as compared to compost which takes time the micros have to act on the compost and make the nutrients available so it's not direct npk but it will provide npk in addition to some of these benefits which the other product cannot provide so again thinking about the biology i would like to stress that when you add compost you're improving the soil biology and of course when the compost you know, degrades, it provides N, P, and K. Now, uh, this is actually from my PhD dissertation uh, and in which I grew tomatoes and cucumbers and, and, and uh, you can see here uh, uh, monocropping and intercropping, so don't worry about that, but focus on C and N, C. C means compost and N, C means no compost. So, uh, this, is, this column here shows the water holding capacity. There is NS means no significant difference between C or NC. So look at this one, 0 0.21, 0 0.22, no difference. Year one, year two, year three, 
So I added compost three years in a row, and the same soil, same site. Now in year three, the soil which was a C here, which is compost, the water holding capacity was 0.37 gram per gram, whereas it was 0.27 for no compost. So now in year three, I am seeing benefits of the compost improving the water holding capacity of the soil. So you can see that so you see the difference there. So again, you don't expect results to be right there in first year. Keep practicing, keep adding compost, and then you will see the benefit. Now, the, the NPK levels in compost can vary depending on what kind of feedstock you used. So if you use dairy manure or feedlot, this is more for commercial production of compost. Poultry manure, crop residue, you can see the compost will have about 1 to 2, uh, 2 to 3 for feedlot manure. Poultry is a little higher, 2 to 4 percent. That's the percentage of nitrogen. Let's focus on nitrogen. What is the percentage of nitrogen in urea? It's 46 percent. So you can see a big difference. It's only 2% in compost, whereas 46% in urea. So again, compost is not just the sole provider of NP and K. And if you decide to use compost to provide the entire amount of nitrogen that is needed by a particular crop, you need to add a lot of compost. Again, that's not always possible. Here are some results uh, of adding compost versus not adding. So you can see here... Uh, a, this is uh, uncovered cucumbers, they were not covered with anything. When I say cover, it's like a floating row cover. You can see compost here at the top, and D is still uncovered, but th it had compost. So look at the difference between when you add compost versus not adding. When you add row cover, again, no compost, and the compost here, look at the size of that plot. There are about 14 plants in there. Look at the, look at the size of that plot. Uh, row cover with 85% light transmission. Look at the uh, size here. N same same row cover material, but compost added. And see the size of that uh, <laughs> that plot. So definitely the lower three pictures show a lot of growth uh, just because of the added compost uh, uh, and, and the benefit it provides to the soil as well. Now, I, I you you are seeing that I'm harping a lot on microbes. I'm saying that it's good for the microbes. They, they will love you. Uh, but how do you know whether microbes are happy? And how do you know whether microbes are, are growing and there are more diverse set of microorganisms or microbes in the soil when you add compost? So we do this test called the community level physiological profiling. Uh, I use, I tell my grad students when you're in a bar or somewhere and you want to show off, maybe just throw this word out there. I do CLPP, Community Level Physiological Profiling. <laughs> well, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> I tell them, don't throw that word out there because otherwise people will think, oh, who is this person? Well, uh, uh, this is what the test is. And, and for you, uh, this, these plates have uh, uh, substrates in there. And when you add soil solutions to these plates, some plates, if the soil had a lot of microbes to begin with, the plate will show more color. So the more the color, the more microbes in, in that soil solution. So look at this one, rye, no compost, rye, compost. Look at this one, it's colorful. Yeah, there are microbes in there. But look at this one, lot many microbes, different types of microbes. So that, again, adding compost helps. Rye and wedge as a cover crop, the, the plot had so rye and wedge. Then no compost was added. When, when compost was added, you see more. Now between these two, you, you see more because there are two cover crops that are growing whereas this one was just rye. So again, adding compost definitely adds both the quantity of microbes and also adds diversity of microbes, as you see in this picture. So again, Mike, this is a visual uh, data for you because otherwise, you know, how do you know whether adding compost worked? So there could be some challenges too associated with uh, using compost, and, and we should recognize that. It's not always a rosy picture. Uh, and as long as you recognize that, then you can mitigate those issues. So some of the potential challenges, high salt concentration in compost. Again, depends on the source. Uh, if you use, if, if let's say the uh, compost was made using uh, uh, dairy manure as the uh, feedstock, sometimes in, in, in the cattle industry, they are fed salts. Uh, again, to produce more milk. Now, those salts will end up in the manure, and that manure is being used to make compost. You will see high salt concentration in, in your uh, compost. And again, high salt, salt concentration is not good uh, uh, for uh, uh, most of the plants. So I'll give you a number. 
the salt usual salt concentration in the soil is measured in EC. So if you have ever done a soil test, you will see this column which says EC, electrical conductivity. And it is usually between 0 to 2. That's the number you're looking for. If it shows 0 0.2 or it shows 1 uh, millimoles per uh, 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 milli uh, millimoles per centimeter or deci siemens per meter, both are the same units, uh, but you're good. 0 to 2 is good. Uh, if the EC, the electrical conductivity, is let's say four now you slowly start seeing symptoms of salt stress on your plant so tomatoes will be okay at four but many crops like such as onions small seeded crops carrots they don't like high salt concentration in the soil and any time over four is not good even for tomatoes or pepper so if you add compost which has a lot of salt a lot of high electrical conductivity value ec value you are adding a lot of salt and that can actually detrimentally affect your plants uh, compost could contain herbicide residues. So let's say uh, you use grass clippings to make compost and there was a herbicide sprayed on, on, the, uh, uh, in, in the, on the grass. So now that herbicide will carry, o carry over to the compost pile and if the compost was not mixed properly, that the temperature went up to about 140, 150 or 120 even and come down. So that product did not disintegrate. That, that chemical product, that herbicide, the active ingredient, the molecule of the herbicide did not disintegrate. And now when you add that compost to your beds, you would wonder, why is it stunting my plants? I added compost and things started going downhill. That's because there was herbicide in the compost. So again, be careful of that. And again, if you are using compost as the only source to provide nitrogen, you need to add a lot of uh, compost. And uh, that is not feasible, and it can also uh, create issues of high phosphorus uh, in the soil. Uh, so again, uh, uh, these are some of the challenges, but again, if you understand w how to mitigate this or how to make good quality compost, you would not confront these uh, challenges. So giving you an example, this is a tomato example. Typically, tomatoes need about 50 to 75 pounds per acre. This is pounds per acre of phosphorus. And let's say I decide uh, to apply, use compost to provide for the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the potassium for my tomato uh, plants. So uh, I let's say I applied about 10 tons to an acre. Again, this is to an acre. Um, you definitely apply way less if you are depending on your area. But let's say 10 tons per acre. 50% is moisture. Usually when you use compost, compost is 50% moisture. So 10 tons is about 20,000 pounds. Half of it is 10,000 pounds. So you have 10,000 pounds of uh, solid material applied. 1.5% nitrogen. So 1.5% of 10,000 pound, pounds is 150. And in one growing season, only 25 to 20% of the nitrogen is available. So the crop availability goes to only... 30 pounds. So you can see here you apply 10 tons of compost to an acre which was which had 1.5% nitrogen you are getting only 30 pounds of nitrogen. For a tomato crop you need 150. I would say between 100 to 150. So still if it's 100 we are three times less in terms of nitrogen. So compost cannot be only compost cannot be the only source of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. Yes, it can supplement. Now this is year one. In year two, you are going to get another about 30 pounds. Year three, again, 30, 40 pounds. So you are, you're, you're building up uh, as, as years go on. But again, don't use compost as the sole source. You can uh, 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 supplement compost with some organic amendments in the soil. Again, this is for commercial production. Homeowners, if you add compost, add some uh, regular 10, 10, 10, or 20, 20, 20 liquid fertilizer, uh, that should be good. So showing you the example here, if I apply 10 tons to an acre, I get about 30 pounds per acre of, uh, of, of nitrogen. Uh, now for phosphorus and potassium, using the same example, you can see in uh, nitrogen, if you remember, it was only 30% or 20% available the first year. In phosphorus, almost 75% is available the first year. And I am adding 112 pounds of nitrogen at, at that rate, which is quite a lot. And if you remember, I mentioned earlier, we need only 75 pounds per acre of uh, phosphorus, typically for vegetables. Now, in this case, we are way more. So if you add compost year after year on a big scale, you are adding more and more phosphorus to the soil, and that could lead to some environmental issues. So uh, too much of compost can also hurt. 
to summarize everything, uh, uh, I hope I gave you a good under uh, information on different uh, uh, methods of baking compost, the recipe, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, which is very critical. You need to know that. And that example which I showed with students to get you started. Uh, and, and some of the challenges too. And again, some examples of how compost can really help and, and benefit our soil. So compost is an excellent amendment uh, that provides nutrients and also builds soil, soil structure and health. Uh, not all composts are made equal. Now, if the compost was not made well or use grass clippings or, or any of the products which had herbicide or has a lot of uh, salt, that compost will hurt the plant rather than benefiting the plant. So again, uh, keeping a handle on how compost is made is important. Use of high quality compost is critical. Again, it goes back to the issue of uh, um, those challenges I mentioned. And of course, understanding the process of composting uh, uh, is essential because it helps you as a homeowner or as a grower, both commercial or homeowner, whichever setup you are. Understanding that process gives you a better handle uh, to create that compost which you are looking for, which the microbes will benefit, the crop will benefit, so that you have the right carbon to nitrogen ratio and all the benefits in terms of you know uh, uh, um, you know how easy is it to apply, no odor, uh, you know it e heats up evenly uh, so that the microbes pa pathogens are taken care of. So again, the process is very important. Now there are some resources. You know, you you obviously can go back to this recording and and my presentation. Uh, uh, but there are some resources which you uh, which are available through ISU Extension and Outreach Store. So if you go to Ext ISU Store, uh, this is one of the publication which myself and Dr. Kathleen Dellett in my department we have authored together. It's called Crop Rotations, Composting, and Cover Crops for Organic Vegetable Production. So. Feel free to go and download this. If you even type ISU in, in, in the Google and type HORT3052, you will get to this publication. It's free to download. It's a PDF, so feel free to do that. Another resource which I find very helpful is On-Farm Composting Handbook. And again, if you Google this, you will find this from, I think it's from Cornell University, uh, but a great resource for more commercial aspects. If you're planning to make bigger piles or, or creating uh, or in or you're working somewhere where they are planning to make compost on a commercial scale so I highly recommend looking uh, or going through that uh, book as well on farm composting handbook with that I would like to thank the some of the uh, agencies with whom I work with and support the sustainable vegetable production work which I do here at Iowa State University if you have any question regarding this presentation or uh, anything in general about vegetable production, feel free to contact me. This is my contact um, slide. And then uh, feel free to check my uh, lab webpage, which is extension.iastate.edu slash vegetable lab. Thank you very much. You have a wonderful growing year. Thank you, Ajay. Now we're going to hear from Aaron Style about growing roses in Iowa. Hello. Thank you for joining me today in our discussion about roses for Iowa. We're going to talk today all about selecting the right rose for your Iowa garden. We're going to talk about a little bit about why roses are so wonderful and the history of them, as well as how to care for them and pick the best rose for your garden. My name is Aaron Style. I am the assistant director at Ryman Gardens uh, and also a lecturer in the Department of Horticulture, both at Iowa State University. You can see my contact information there. And uh, today we're going to be talking roses, as I mentioned. Our general overview of our discussion today is a real brief history of roses and then how to take care of roses here in Iowa. And we'll wrap up our discussion on how to select and find some of the best suited roses for our climate, including a large discussion about roses developed at Iowa State by Dr. Griffith Buck, often referred to as Buck Roses. So let's get started. Roses have a lot of allure. They have been written about and, and painted and photographed and admired for thousands of years. And in fact, it is known that roses have been grown for at least 5,000 years in China, and they were important to the Greeks, uh, Romans, and ancient Egyptians. 
they are also important to us in modern, more modern times. Uh, it is, of course, Iowa's state flower. And uh, an interesting fact, although no official species was recognized by the state legislature when they named the wild rose as our state flower, Rosa arkansana, or arkansana, is often thought of as the rose that is the, the species that is our state flower. But it really could be any of the three native wild roses, including Rosa blanda or Rosa carolina. So uh, this very popular flower is not only um, popular in Iowa, of course, but it's also the state flower of New York, North Dakota, and Georgia. It is the national flower for England, and nearly universally across the globe, it is considered a revered plant and a symbol of love. One of the biggest reasons folks really enjoy roses is because they are very easy to hybridize. Uh, making crosses and creating new plants is easy for uh, hobbyists and amateurs, um, and so many new varieties uh, are always being introduced because of their ease of hybridizing. Most modern roses that we see in our gardens today were introduced from and developed from roses brought from China to Europe in the late 1700s and early 1800s. There are four in particular that um, are often referred to as the stud China roses that have been very important in a lot of breeding done in Europe in the early 1800s, which then, of course, came over to North America. Um, but there are many more than just these four roses uh, that have influenced rose breeding in the modern era. And because these roses, um, some of them aren't as cold hardy or um, many of them are um, a bit more finicky when it comes to disease and things, um, many of these new roses or hybrid teas really became uh, very important, especially in the late 1800s. And many of the roses that came out of this era focused on the really wonderful attributes of those original stud china roses uh, from Asia, including things like petal color and flower um, form, as well as um, multiple or re repeat bloom throughout the season. The most notable thing that many of them lacked during this time was fragrance. Although roses are very fragrant, and uh, some roses, that is one of the primary reasons to grow those flowers. And interestingly, the hips are also even edible. The hip or fruit of the rose can be used to make tea. It's also uh, a wonderful source of vitamin C um, and uh, quite ornamental uh, later in the season. As I mentioned, much of the past rose breeding uh, back in the 1800s really focused on form and color. So petal numbers and different uh, color, uh, reds, pinks, whites, yellows, uh, peaches, that kind of thing. But in the recent past, say in the last 50 years, and in, in particular in the last 20 to 30 years, breeding has really changed to include a big emphasis on hardiness, winter hardiness, or cold tolerance, as well as disease resistance. And these are the roses that we will focus on selecting here in Iowa because they are easier to care for and less finicky. They don't have that, um, the kind of note of being fussy or hard to care for that many people first think of when they think of growing roses. In fact, most roses are quite tolerant and very um, robust and vigorous plants. And so uh, growing them shouldn't be a chore. And we'll talk about some of that here in just a little bit. The care for roses uh, is relatively sim similar no matter what type of rose you're using. So we'll start at the beginning with planting. There are two major ways that you can acquire roses. Bare root plants are very economical and are often sold through mail order sources. And mail order sources provide a much wider uh, variety than um, other types of more local sources. So bare root plants shouldn't be scary. Roses propagate and grow very well from bare root plants. When you receive them, you want to soak them in warm water for about four hours up to a day. You want to prune back some of the root tips and also prune out any soft black or dead pieces from the uh, bare root plant. 
and make sure that you never let these these uh, plants dry out, which can be very easy if you're not quite ready to s to plant them when they arrive in the mail. So keep them uh, relatively moist and um, allow them uh, in a kind of a dark, cool spot before you get them out and planted. In general, you'll find roses are either grafted or not. And as time goes on, the last 10 years in particular, there's been a strong emphasis away from grafted roses. A grafted rose has a different rootstock underneath that may help it grow in, in a, a wider variety of conditions. And you'll notice on that top photo there, uh, we're pointing at that graft union. It's a swelling or crook, kind of a, a knob where these two pieces of plants were grafted or put together. If you have a grafted plant, that's important to note because the location and where you put that graft union is really important in the planting. If you have a graft, that needs to go down about three to four inches to help protect it during the winter. If there is no graft, then you just need to plant it so the uppermost roots are just below the soil. The other way to get roses, and probably the way that most people are more comfortable with, are as potted plants. And of course, you can acquire roses through mail order um, as potted plants, but they are very easily found at local and national nurseries and garden centers. If it is grafted, it is almost certainly that that uh, that is almost certain that that graft union will be above the soil line. So you'll want to make sure that 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 root ball is planted deep enough so that the graft is three to four inches below the soil. If it's not grafted, then you just simply plant it like you would any other uh, shrub or perennial at the same level that it is in the pot. You'll want to make sure you water it in well after planting and throughout that first summer in particular watering consistently to help get that plant established. And then as those plants become established, summer care includes being sure to always irrigate. Roses are not particularly drought tolerant to get the best blooms. And so good irrigation is uh, really important for the best flower. The first growing season, of course, getting that plant established and watering is one of the best ways to do that is very important. You'll want to fertilize in late spring first uh, part of June, maybe the last part of May, about when they first start to bloom. And a, a nice slow release uh, all-purpose fertilizer will work, or you can also find many uh, rose-specific fertilizers that would work well too. Throughout the summer, you're going to monitor weekly for stress. Things like uh, water or drought stress, insect disease or animal damage, those types of things. And we'll talk more about how to deal with those in just a bit. And one of the very most important things is you'll want to mulch. Conserving moisture and uh, suppressing weeds, all of these things can help roses grow uh, their very best. And so mulch is a very important step in here. And any mulch of your choosing is uh, typically very good for roses. Shredded bark or um, kind of wood mulch works well, but so can leaf mold and other types of compost. Whatever you prefer to use for roses and mulch uh, will work well. Throughout the summer, if you notice any damaged, diseased, or dead canes, you can remove or prune those off. Anytime you see a cane, if you have one of those roses with a graft on it, occasionally a branch will come up from below the graft union. Well, we'll call those suckers, and you'll want to remove those very soon. They can very quickly overtake the upper part of the plant, and the flowers look different if they grow from the below the graft union. That can be a little hard to, to recognize with the graft union buried three to four inches below the soil. So anything that kind of comes up out of the soil, you'll want to investigate, see if the leaves look similar or a little bit different, and remove them if they are truly uh, arising below the graft union. Deadheading is important for good floral display throughout the summer and so weekly is ideal for removing the spent blossoms and usually we'll start that as soon as they begin blooming in late May uh, through uh, mid-October. You'll want to stop later in the season to allow for ornamental hips to form. They can help uh, add to the attractiveness of the plant later in the season. They also look nice over the winter hanging on and uh, stop, stopping deadheading can also help the plant kind of prepare for winter. 
Usually about mid-October is when you want to do this, although you can stop deadheading as early as mid-September to really promote uh, the formation of these ornamental hips that, uh, or the fruit of the rose. Deadheading is kind of an ongoing project that really helps with uh, the display and flower quality in roses, and so deadheading is an important exercise to know more about. That very first year of your rose, you'll want to only prune down when you remove that spent blossom. You'll want to prune down to the first set of three leaves. Roses have compound leaves. The younger or upper leaves tend to have just three little leaflets, and further down on the plant, they'll tend to have more like five or even more, depending on the plant. And so you'll want to, at first year, you want to prune down to the first set of three leaves. And then after that, once that shrub is a little larger, you can prune down to the first set of five leaves when you remove the flower heads. And if, you're, if your rose is the type that flowers in larger clusters, you can always pull out the spent flowers within the cluster. And then once the entire cluster is finished, remove that down to those marks that I just mentioned. Make sure, of course, you're always using sharp and clean pruners or uh, um, nice scissors to make these cuts so that you don't spread any disease or uh, problems and that you make nice clean cuts uh, to keep the plant nice and healthy. Now, depending on the type of rose you have, you may need to provide winter protection. This is particularly important for hybrid tea roses, grandiflora type roses, and floribunda. And uh, winter care in Iowa can be a little bit of work, uh, but it will have good success when done uh, well. So the first step for this is to tie up all the canes. Do no pruning this time of year. You want to remove the mulch because you're going to bring in topsoil, and uh, you're going to mound that up around the base of the plant about 12 inches. Fence in the area, whether it's the entire bed or just the plant, and add about three feet of straw. And you're going to do this just before Thanksgiving most years. You'll need to watch the weather, but when, uh, when things start to cool down, those, this, the very top layer of soil maybe freezes once, uh, that would be the ideal time to put this uh, winter protection on your roses. In the spring, you're going to do the exact opposite. So you're going to remove all those overwintering materials, the straw, the topsoil, and you may have to do this in a couple of stages depending on how frozen all of that is. So you may only be able to rake off the top part of the straw and wait a day before you can pull off the rest of it after it thaws out. This is the time that you will untie that plant, let the branches down, and remove any dead canes cut back plants um, back to the point where they start growing again. And you may be able to do this in mid-March, or you may have to wait a little bit to see what, what greens up uh, in the season. And then, of course, you can replace the mulch. This is a lot of work, which is why things like hybrid tea, grandiflora, and floribunda roses are known to be so finicky. Because for us here in Iowa, they require this type of protection. There are roses, however, that don't require this much work to overwinter, and we'll talk more about those types in a little bit. One thing that you will find in stores are these rose cones, and I uh, really encourage you to steer clear of these styrofoam covers for your roses for a couple of reasons. One is it is nearly impossible to get any rose underneath one of these cones in the fall without cutting them back sometimes pretty dramatically, and fall is not the time to cut back these plants. So uh, using these cones requires a lot of cutback, which isn't ideal. Additionally, they often heat up in warm, sunny days in the middle of winter, which can cause the rose shrubs to come out of dormancy prematurely, which, of course, can uh, be a lot of problem. And, you know, even if neither of those things are that important to you, which they should be, but if, even if they're not, this is so ugly uh, to have in your garden all winter. Using a nice um, uh, leaf mulch or straw mulch and a nice uh, mulch that doesn't compact down and uh, having it blend in better with the surrounding garden will be much more attractive through the winter. And it doesn't require premature pruning and it doesn't force the plant out of dormancy too soon. 
Pruning is very important for many roses, especially those ones that require winter protection. So that first year, you're not going to do any pruning except to remove anything that is damaged, dead, or diseased. And uh, we want to have that plant produce as much as it can to get nicely established. That second year, you'll want to leave basal breaks. So these are the branches that form near the base of the plant, but not below that graft union if there is one. And remove any spindly or other small growth. Subsequent years, you're going to either tag or note, photograph maybe, underperforming stems, things that don't seem to be flowering very well so that you can remove them early in the spring. And whenever you make a pruning cut, your goal is to direct the growth in the direction that you need it to go, which in nearly all cases is going to be outward. So when you make a cut or a pruning cut, you'll want to cut back to just above a bud that faces outward and not inward. We want to open up these plants as much as possible to help with uh, disease issues in particular. There are some insect and animal issues that roses face on a general basis. They include things like aphids, Japanese beetle, leafcutter bees, and a rose slug or sawfly, and then also some animals like rabbits and deer who really enjoy eating these plants. And uh, care for these really um, includes being very vigilant and addressing issues as soon as you see them. And I always look at it in terms of the, this order. First off, what will I tolerate? You know, leaf cutter bees cut out little circles in the leaves, but really don't otherwise distract from the plant itself. And they are, leaf cutter bees are important uh, kind of insects in our ecosystem. So working to eliminate those is probably not that important. I can tolerate leaf cutter bees. Things like aphids, I can maybe use uh, more cultural, some cultural methods like uh, hosing off with a forceful uh, stream of water or something like that. Um, rabbits and deer, I might be able to put up uh, a physical exclusion, especially at certain times of the year, like early spring when there's not much for them to eat and they're more likely to browse on my roses than other times of the year. We can do cultural methods like uh, the bucket and uh, a hand method here for controlling Japanese beetle. Japanese beetles are only around for a few weeks over the summer, but when they're here, they're a big deal. And one of the interesting things about these insects is they tend to cluster. They love roses. And if you go out early in the morning and you find them all clustered up on the end of a branch, you hold a bucket of soapy water underneath, you tap that branch, one of their first responses is to drop straight down and right into your bucket and you've just eliminated a whole bunch of beetles without any chemical control. Occasionally you'll get to a point where a chemical is needed and uh, you can find many insecticides that are, are useful for things like roses and of course you would apply them um, as labeled on the bottle. While insects and animals and, and those types of things can be problematic with roses, one of the biggest issues most gardeners face with rose care are diseases, specifically things like black spot and powdery mildew. These diseases can cause severe defoliation, which can really distract from the beauty of the plant and really take away from the health of the plant. And again, this is one of those things where a black, you know, a spot here or there on the leaf isn't going to be a big deal. I can tolerate that. My next uh, step is to really look at cultural methods. What can I do to help improve and reduce the amount of these fungal diseases? Sometimes that means I, my next step is our chemical control, and there are many different fungicides that can be used for this. And occasionally the only thing that I can do to help prevent this from becoming a bigger issue is to remove the infected plants. This is particularly true for viral diseases like rose mosaic virus. Uh, these cannot be controlled with a fungicide, so uh, they are part of the plant, they're part of the genome, and so to prevent them from spreading, often your only, your only method is to remove the plant and destroy it. As I mentioned, I like to start with cultural control when dealing with disease issues, and so there are many things we can do to prevent kind of what we're seeing here in this photo, which is these wonderful flowers, but this terrible looking foliage below it. 
watering in the early morning so that the water can evaporate off of leaf surfaces relatively quickly instead of in the evening where it sits all, all night before evaporating. Making sure that we're watering deeply and infrequently and keeping that foliage dry whenever possible. So using things like soaker hoses or um, kind of specific irrigation systems that uh, put water directly at the base of the plant instead of getting foliage wet can be really beneficial for controlling diseases, especially things like black spot. You want to discard any fallen or diseased leaves from the plant. That way you can eliminate some of those things that may infect these roses in the future. And having good uh, spacing and planting these roses in appropriate locations to reduce stress. Spacing to help increase airflow when branches are really crowded and, and, and um, you can't get very good circulation around the plant. You have more likelihood of these diseases developing on them. And finally, one of the best ways to approach disease issues is to simply find roses that are more tolerant and resistant of these diseases. And it's one of the reasons why the modern shrub rose, which we'll talk more about in a little bit, is so popular because they are bred and are naturally resistant to some of these big problems. It doesn't mean that they won't develop on extreme years or even have a few problems here and there. But some roses are very susceptible to these diseases and without significant work would be completely defoliated. And other roses are naturally immune to them or are nearly immune to them and don't require a lot of work at all. If you are, are really wanting to grow some of these hybrid teas or grandiflora floribunda type roses that are really susceptible to things like black spot, you will likely have to use some chemical control. And there are a variety of fungicides that can be used. This is just a short list of active ingredients that you might look for. The thing to keep in mind is that this will be a regular uh, weekly garden chore probably within your rose garden if you decide to go down this route. And you'll want to make sure that you cycle and rotate fungicides with different modes of action and different kind of um, some fungicides work more to help control problems that exist and others work more to help prevent those problems from becoming established and so rotating through different types of fungicides can help with that certainly there are other types of there are types of fungicides like potassium bicarbonate that are a little more friendly to use than others but all of them should of course be applied according to label directions Keep in mind that when you start to see issues like black spot, it's very difficult to correct that. In most cases, fungicides are much better applied as a preventative uh, to keep things from getting out of control and not as a reactionary response in terms of noticing that the plant has lots of black spot and hardly any leaves. Uh, that is at a point where you're going to have a really difficult time, even with fungicides, getting it under control. Ryman Gardens, uh, where I work, has many different rose gardens. We're known for our rose collection at the gardens, including a Buck Rose Garden that features collection of, of roses developed by Dr. Buck at Iowa State University. Our Jones Rose Garden is a formal space that looks at roses interplanted with other types of plants, because rarely do we have roses all by themselves. And I would argue that most roses look best when planted with other types of plants. We have an antique rose garden. This is uh, older varieties that tend to bloom only at, uh, in the spring and don't have kind of a, a repeat season of bloom. And we also trial roses. We are uh, a trial location for the American Garden Rose Selection. And uh, so we're constantly looking at new plants and seeing how they perform, evaluating them, sending that back to that national organization for them to make recommendations to the general public about how well roses do. The American Rose Society actually recognizes 37 different classes of roses. But in general, you can divide them into three major groups. We have our species or wild roses. These are the ones that you might find if you're walking out in the woods. We have our old garden roses, which tend to have one season of bloom, tend to have uh, moderate to poor disease resistance, depending on the variety. And then we have our more modern roses. And these are the ones that you're most likely going to find 
in stores, uh, nurseries, and garden centers. And I'm going to focus on the modern roses here since those are the ones you're almost certainly going to run across. Of the modern roses, there are kind of six major groups. I've already mentioned several times the hybrid tea, floribunda, grandiflora roses. These are the roses we often think of when we think of roses. The boutonnieres and corsages that you have for weddings or proms, those are often hybrid teas. These roses tend to be more work in Iowa, as opposed to things like miniature, uh, what's sometimes called landscape or shrub roses, or climbing and rambling roses. Miniature roses are simply just those that are smaller in stature and the flowers are small. Climbing and rambling roses are those roses that have very long canes that need support or, or uh, kind of ramble or uh, somewhat climb on support. The, these three groups are much better suited for Iowa gardens because they tend to be naturally uh, winter hardy uh, in Iowa and uh, most of them, especially in the landscape shrub group, tend to have better disease resistance that would not require the heavy use of fungicides and other chemicals uh, to make them look good. So I would highly encourage you when out in the garden center, even though the hybrid teas will be very alluring, <laughs> uh, to really look and very carefully consider growing a landscape or a shrub rose um, or one of these other two in your garden, um, at least to start. When selecting roses, you'll want to consider the growing conditions. All roses want to be in full sun. That's at least six hours of direct light every day. They also need very fertile and well-drained uh, moist soil, um, which we can provide uh, pretty well here in Iowa. Occasionally we have trouble with drainage, but adding compost and other things to help improve that can be really beneficial. Other things you'll want to look at are things like color. Roses tend to come in pinks and reds and whites, sometimes yellows, and then shades in between. You can, of course, get bicolors and, and other things like that. You'll want to look at things like the flower form. Um, some of them are kind of open with very prominent yellow stamens in the center, and others have uh, dozens and dozens of petals that give them that very classic rose look. I would encourage you to really hunt down roses that have good fragrance. It is one of the best things about roses and um, unfortunately sometimes one of the hardest things to find. And so when you find a rose with good fragrance uh, and it also has some of these other attributes like winter hardiness, good disease resistance, it becomes a real easy one to plant in your garden. Vigor is important, especially um, when we talk about uh, how well it establishes itself and how well it can deal with a wide range of conditions that we have here in Iowa. You want to look for roses that rebloom throughout the season and, uh, of course, those that are more winter hardy and disease resistant. And anything um, that can help reduce pest pressure uh, is going to be important. So making sure that you're putting roses not in a spot where you frequently see deer browsing because this will be one of the favorites for deer. You very rarely will plant roses all by themselves and uh, these are just some of the plants that can do really well alongside roses. Uh, when it comes to hydrangeas in particular panicle hydrangeas can do very well um, because they like the same light conditions that many roses do really well in. Things like Buddleia, dwarf conifers, viburnums, nine bark smoke bush, these are all nice woody plants that complement uh, roses quite well. And when we look at uh, other perennials, things like ornamental grasses, wormwoods, salvias, alliums, these are all wonderful perennials or bulbs that complement roses well. It's important to consider form, color, and texture. In general, roses are very coarse plants, and so having fine textured plants next to them is always a nice foil. And of course, no matter what plant you select, you want to be sure that it also tolerates full sun, at least six hours a day, as well as uh, um, the same soil and uh, fertility requirements, which most plants would appreciate that well-drained, fertile soil. So what kinds of roses should you look for? There are literally hundreds 
of varieties out there to choose from. So as you're flipping through catalogs, clicking through websites, or browsing in a nursery or garden center, look for some of these groups or types of roses. There are some roses that are designated by the EarthKind program. This is a, a program developed and run out of Texas A&M. And they're not a breeding program. They're an evaluation program that gives a designation to roses that do well in, um, uh, in terms of water uh, usage, uh, disease resistance, uh, things that are um, roses that do well without a lot of inputs. Cordis is a, a breeder out of Europe, out of Germany, that has been uh, going on. That family has been breeding roses for over 100 years. Uh, and many of these roses, because of where they're developed in Europe, also do quite well in the Midwest. And there's, so there's huge variety of these roses available when you uh, look for Cordis roses. The uh, Bailey Nurseries out of the Twin Cities has a line of roses developed by Ping Lim, uh, called Easy Elegance. They have a wide range of colors and forms. They range from kind of smaller shrubs like Little Mischief all the way up to more classic looking roses in a wide variety of colors. And all of these are very winter hardy and have really good disease resistance. The knockouts, or what are often referred to as the rads, were developed by uh, rose breeder Will Radler. And uh, the knockout rose might be the most popular rose in the United States, if not the world. And it's very popular because it is a winter hardy plant, although not reliably top hardy in all parts of Iowa. It does overwinter pretty well. Uh, it has a wonderful deep kind of pink color and has great disease resistance, which makes it a very popular plant. And uh, there are other options besides knockout, including things like pink knockout, uh, rainbow knockout, and others. Oh So Easy Roses are another line of roses that were developed by a variety of hybridizers uh, and have been introduced by primarily proven winners. These are also, much like the Easy Elegance Roses, come in a wide variety of colors and forms and are emphasized with disease resistance and winter hardiness. And the last group of roses I'll talk at more depth in are the buck roses. These were roses developed at Iowa State, uh, and there are well over 50 of them that are relatively easy to find, uh, especially online. They were developed by Dr. Griffith Buck at Iowa State. And uh, these roses were uh, bred to be naturally disease-resistant and winter-hardy, over 85 types. Most of them are pinks or shades of pinks, but there are also some that come in other typical rose colors like red, you know, creamy whites, um, apricots, and, and other colors like that. Most of them are shrub or landscape roses, although there are a few exceptions. There are one or two buck roses that are actually hybrid teas, so they would require some winter protection. But most of, the, most of the plants that Dr. Buck developed at Iowa State were crossed and grown out in fields, and they were evaluated. And it was the, a case of the strong survive. They, were not, um, they did not receive any winter protection. They did not get sprayed for any diseases. And so those that were able to live uh, over the course of two or three years in the field were then uh, reevaluated, pulled out, maybe used to make additional crosses or um, looked at to see if they had any um, merits for being released. And while um, many of Dr. Buck's roses um, are not widely available um, on the commercial market, most of the modern roses that you would find in any garden center or greenhouse today, one of their parents or one of the parents of the parents of those plants are one of Dr. Buck's roses. And that makes them a really important kind of link in modern rose breeding. A little bit more about Dr. Buck. He was at Iowa State uh, from the in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s, and he had a very productive career in rose breeding. He became interested in breeding roses after he exchanged letters with us uh, with Pedro Dot, uh, who was a Spanish rose grower. 
he developed more than 85 rose cultivars, or he officially released more than 85 rose cultivars. He also worked in breeding of geraniums or pelargoniums, the annual geraniums that you see on porches and stuff like that, and one heliotrope called Iowa. In 1973, his patent uh, for red sparkler was the first plant patent granted to Iowa State. And uh, he was also noted uh, in the rose community as being one of the first hybridizers of a quote-unquote blue rose. This is a color that is very elusive in the rose world. And even his blue skies rose isn't terribly blue. It's pretty lavender. Uh, but at the time, it was definitely one of the bluest-looking roses. He has been so influential in the world of rose breeding that there is even an annual award given by the American Rose Society uh, in his honor and even includes a trophy. At Ryman Gardens, we have the world's largest collection of his roses. Uh, we have 76 of his 85 cultivars, and uh, there's also 10 newly released cultivars beyond that 85 um, that his uh, family and other growers have released from his breeding um, after, uh, after he passed away. So um, there are nearly 100 buck roses available. Some of them have been lost um, because of um, various things. Um, plants of all, of all types are incredibly... Um, uh, there's a lot of trends in plants. And so often uh, people are most interested in the newest of roses, and sometimes that's at the detriment of some of the older ones. And so uh, older varieties and cultivars can very easily be lost if not well, well cared for or well documented. And of course, uh, some of his roses um, have been nearly lost. We have over 400 uh, buck roses at Ryman Gardens, and this collection is so important to the rose world that it is recognized as a nationally accredited plant collection through the Plant Collections Network of the American Public Gardens Association. We're always asking people if they've seen some of these roses. These are the roses um, that nobody has any documented um, uh, it has documented in their garden. So uh, we have found Pippa's song, and uh, but the other ones, uh, you can see we have some old photographs of these plants. Uh, the other ones have yet to be positively identified. So if you ever run across a rose that might look a little bit like this, I would be very interested in talking to you. Some of our favorite buck roses uh, include Carefree Beauty, which is by far his most popular rose. Carefree Beauty has wonderful, kind of loosely double, beautiful, bright pink flowers. It has a heavy and frequent rebloom and grows on a relatively large shrub, almost five feet tall. It has wonderful disease resistance. You can see in the photo here, there's very little black spot on that plant. And this is, it goes through cycles of bloom throughout the entire growing season, which is one of the things that makes this plant so popular. Distant Drums is another uh, popular and favorite buck rose of mine. This is one that has some really interesting shades of both pink, but also some rose and purple with a little bit of gold and tan, and it changes as the flower ages, which is really fun. It has a really nice fragrance and is a little bit smaller than Carefree Beauty. Folk Singer is one that does quite well in Iowa. It has kind of yellowish pink flowers, uh, kind of a peachy uh, color. It is very upright and, and relatively large and is covered with flowers like these throughout the growing season. And all of Dr. Buck's roses repeat even better when you deadhead, which is why that uh, care is so important. Honey Sweet is a wonderful color and a beautiful kind of reddish orange um, with a really nice fragrance, uh, fragrance, hence the name Honey Sweet. Earth Song is another one, a relatively large, wonderful soft rose uh, color and a relatively um, large kind of multi-petaled flower. 
I had mentioned that uh, Blue Skies was one of the first blue roses. And uh, Blue Skies is a hybrid tea. So it is not winter hardy here in Iowa, unlike all of the other buck roses that I mentioned. These roses, none of them would need all of that winter protection with the soil and the straw that I mentioned earlier. But Blue Skies, you can kind of see a little bit of blue, especially if you kind of look at it in the right light. It's really very quite uh, lavender, but still was a big breakthrough in rose breeding uh, in the early 70s when it was released. So these roses are available from a variety of sources, and all of the roses I mentioned earlier, things like Easy Elegance, Oh So Easy, the Cordes Roses, those that are recognized by the Earthkind program, all of these can be found at a variety of retailers. But here are some suppliers, especially those if you're looking for a very specific rose, especially those available by mail order. So uh, any of these wonderful mail order nurseries can provide some of the roses that I talked about today that are well suited for Iowa. If you're looking to get something local, many nurseries uh, have the Easy Elegance line, the Oh So Easy, and the Knockout roses. Those are easily acquired by many different sources and do quite well in Iowa. One of the great resources that, out, that is out there is the American Rose Society, and they have a nursery guide on their website that they change every year because, of course, uh, nurseries come and go, and their quality goes up and down, and so the American Rose Society is committed to uh, f showing you some of the best sources for different roses. And, of course, all of these sources are available there, and others are too. So looking for very specific types or very specific cultivars of roses, uh, many of them can be found at these suppliers. There are other resources available, um, including the American Rose Society, which is a wonderful resource. Things from Iowa State include these publications. Of course, the Internet is full of things. And uh, good sources on the Internet, especially if you're looking to find information about specific cultivars of roses, helpmefind.com is a, rate, a really nice source for that. And one really nice book that might be worth investing in uh, was one called Growing Roses in Cold Climates. So hopefully this gives you a great uh, sense of what you can find out there for roses. Um, Ryman Gardens is another great spot to see roses. We are located in Ames, just south of Jack Trice Stadium, uh, more than 14 acres. We've been around since 1995, and we're open year-round seven days a week. Uh, I've already mentioned all of the different rose gardens that we have, and so if you're looking to find specific cultivars uh, that you want to see what they look like, uh, the gardens might be a great way to do that. Every year we have a theme. It helps give us structure to programs. It gives us great ideas and encourages repeat visits and, and many other things. It allows us to make big changes in the garden year to year. So each year when you visit Ryman Gardens, you can see big changes. We have a wonderful indoor conservatory that's open year-round, features a garden railroad. Uh, during the holidays, and we also have a very nice butterfly flight house, or what we call the butterfly wing. It's even shaped like a butterfly. That is also open year-round, and native and tropical butterflies, um, nearly 800 of 50 different types are flying around uh, every day. We, of course, have wonderful rose gardens. We have a nice herb garden. Our Campanile garden features big uh, tulip displays in the spring and wonderful annual displays throughout the summer and into the fall. We have a wonderful lake that features things like the Victoria um, water platter that you see there up in the upper corner, as well as a children's garden and uh, our home demonstration garden, which we call the town and country garden, to give you ideas of how you might use things like roses in your own landscape. As I come to a close with our uh, presentation today, I want to part with this wonderful quote I really enjoy. I think it's just a wonderful way of looking at life and uh, I think gardeners get this even better than maybe the general public. Some people grumble that roses have thorns. I am grateful that thorns have roses. 
That concludes our talk on Roses for Iowa. I'm always open to hearing from you if you have any questions. You can see my contact information there. Um, I'd love to answer any questions you may have about roses or about Ryman Gardens or about any gardening topic you might have. I hope this gives you some inspiration to not be afraid of these plants. Many, especially the landscape and shrub roses, are much more friendly on the gardener. They are not picky kind of princesses in your in your yard and instead can be very uh, easy to grow and beautiful plants throughout the growing season so i hope this gives you motivation to get out find the great rose for your garden and enjoy <music>